Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to A Tortoise Thinking with Ashley Audrain on this here book, The Push, um, which is her um, debut novel, annoyingly, to come out strong and fast with the first book that has already started breaking all manner of publishing um, records, the rights have been optioned for film and TV. Um, it's been translated into umpteen languages. It's really going great guns. And um, I'm really thrilled to be here this evening, not least because I get to talk about something that really, really matters um, to me. And in a way that is, um, I hope, um, kind of safe. A, a lot of what we're going to be talking about this evening is are, are things that are traditionally not spoken about, and that in many ways is the power of the book. So I do hope that people will feel confident to join in and to share their own experiences and reflections. Um, my colleague Claudia um, will be in the chat um, sort of marshalling your feedback and your thoughts and your ideas. And I hope that today, there she is, hello Claudia. Um, and I hope that today will be an opportunity for us to sort of say things that perhaps we haven't said out loud before um, and to share a little bit on um, this experience that, you know, something like a fifth of the world or something shares in being a mother. Um, um, but sometimes we're not very good at being honest about it. Now at my school, I went to an all girls school. At my school, they made us read The Fifth Child by Doris Lessing in the summer in between GCSEs and A-level. So when you're 16, basically. And um, they did that openly as a form of contraception. The book is about a family and sort of have this idyllic family life. They have four children and the fifth one is basically a nightmare. And I think that possibly the push could be the new prescription of um, schools wanting to dissuade young women uh, from um, starting a family. So Ashley, thank you so much for being here all the way from Toronto. Could you just start with a bit about, you know, what's it about? What's the germ of the idea? Tell us a little bit about the context of the book. Sure, thank you, Liz, for that introduction and for having me, this is so great. Um, and I really appreciate that, that setup of having this open forum to talk about this topic. Um, so the push is about a woman named Blythe and she comes from a history of women who struggled greatly with motherhood, her own mother and grandmother. And she's very determined to break that cycle. You know, she wants to be the very warm, present, engaged mother that she never had herself. And she's in a marriage. Um, so she and her husband have a baby named Violet. But it isn't long until she starts to believe that there is something different, something wrong with Violet. She's quite aloof and distant. She's quite an angry little girl. And she soon begins acting maliciously towards other children. And the problem, of course, is that her husband, you know, cannot see in their daughter what Blythe can see. And he thinks this is very much, um, you know, her maternal anxiety, that this is really all in her head um, because she has worried about motherhood for so long. And so as a family, they try to move on and they have another child, Sam. And in Sam, she does find that maternal connection that she'd always hoped for um, until something in the family goes terribly wrong. And they're really forced to take a look at who their daughter is, um, who Blythe herself is you know, what has happened and the family unravels from there. So it's, you know, it's very much a book about the expectations of motherhood. And that is really what I set out to write about with this book is how different motherhood can be from, um, you know, the way society tells us it should be and how it should feel. And even the way we're sort of meant to talk about it. Um, so that, I think that's at the core of the book, but it, it also kind of explores some issues that, um, that are related to that, like, you know, nature versus nurture and where we learn to mother and how we learn to be and what we owe our children. And I think most importantly, the book is about um, something that you've just touched on, which is really about, you know, making space for women's truths and believing women's truths and their experiences um, and the repercussions of what can happen if we don't. Mm. Um, the first 70 pages or so um before the sort of nature of violet becomes apparent i was kind of screaming in recognition um both in terms of the sort of blossoming of the relationship and then the sort of how you can grieve for the relationship that you, you used to have when a baby comes along even though you're still in the relationship and the sort of beginning of the disintegration of your sense of self and how people 
sort of refer to you as mom instead of by your name. And, you know, as somebody that really struggled, really struggled with early motherhood. I mean, I, I genuinely feel I sort of only just survived. Um, mm. the, the obvious question of it is how much of it is drawn from experience? I mean, probably not the sort of murderous baby part, <laughs> but how much of it is drawn from experience? And, and, and if it is, how hard was it to write it honestly? Because it's really brutal. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, you know, there, there is a lot of honesty in those pages and a, a lot of emotion that I was feeling at the time is, is in this book. And I think that's why, you know, I've, I've heard from so many women to say that they're, that they can see their own experience in this, because I think that the difficult experience of motherhood is a very common one, even though we don't talk about that often or we don't feel like we can really go there. But I started writing this book when my son was six months old. That was my first um, child. So he was six months old. And he, you know, I had gone into motherhood with a bit of trepidation, I think. Like I, I didn't always know if I would be a mother or I didn't always know if I wanted to be a mom. Um, but you know, that, that time in life kind of came around, I think I was 32, um, and you know, had a partner and we, we decided it was something we wanted to do. And I was nervous about it. Like I, I, I didn't go into it with a lot of confidence, but, um, but then when my son was born two weeks after he was born, we discovered he had like some fairly significant health challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, and that had us, you know, living in the children's hospital here in Toronto, you know, for a long time. Like I, I think we, our first stay was six weeks long, you know, when he was just a, a newborn and then we were there again and again, kind of over the course of those first six months. And he had just a lot of difficulty with all the things that are supposed to come easily, like growing and eating and, you know, all those things that you sort of take for, you assume that you are going to be able to provide for your child, you know, that was not working for him. And so those days were, you know, exceptionally challenging. And I think, you know, there are all kinds of ways that that early motherhood can be very difficult. And you've mentioned that you, you struggled at that time as well. You know, I, I didn't have like postpartum depression per se, but but I was learning how to be a mother, you know, within the walls of a hospital and, you know, the nurses were teaching me what to do instead of, you know, like my own mom in the comfort of my own home. And mm -hmm. you, you mentioned something so that resonates really with me, which is people calling you mom, you know, instead mm -hmm. of your name and that loss of identity. And I don't know if people will really know this if you haven't spent time in a children's hospital, but in a, in a hospital, they, you know, everybody there, all the doctors, all the nurses, everybody who sees your child, and there's like teams of people, they know your child's name, which is wonderful, and you're grateful for that, but they don't know your name as a parent, and they'd never even ask, mm -hmm. and you, you can understand why, because they can't possibly keep track of, you know, all of those parents and caregivers that are there, but that means that, you know, especially for the first few months of my motherhood, you know, nobody used my name. It was just mom, you know, administer this or mom, we've got to take the baby here or mom, the baby needs a needle, like all those things. And so that real, there was a real kind of shock of identity. And I felt like I was learning how to be a mother, but I was learning how to be like a caregiver to an ill human and kind of yeah. figuring that all out at once. Yeah. And so, you know, but I, but I did kind of get my footing around that six month mark. Um, and I think maybe because I'd had such a shock of what, of the beginning of motherhood and because I had such a huge loss of identity, um, writing for me at that time, uh, like I felt hugely creative at that time and had this real urge to carve out the time when I could, which wasn't often, to be writing scenes and exploring this life of this other woman who was, you know, arguably going through a more difficult period than I was, but something quite comparable, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, so it became like quite cathartic and uh, just was a real outlet for me at that time. So yeah, I think there, there, there's definitely a lot of honesty on that page about, <laughs> you know, about those challenges, even though, yeah. you know, mine were different. And um, I can see the chat has woken up um quickly <laughs> with people sort of sharing ideas and thoughts and things and I'd love to come um in a little time um to to perhaps Laura Morris who's shared a, a word I haven't heard before but before I do that um we, you've talked a bit of, already about expectations and um one of the one of the quotes and I don't think it's from the book actually I think it's in the promotional material but it says we expect to have good mothers and to marry and to be good mothers and um the sort of feminist in me 
really rails against that sentence. Um, but there's a lot of mothers in this book. And so we shouldn't sort of only talk about the relationship between Blythe and Violet, because there are a lot of mothers. There's Etta, who's Blythe's grandma, and there's Cecilia, who's her mum, and then there's the mother-in-law, Helen, important relationship there. The, the, there are a lot of, and Mrs Ellington, of course, who's the sort of adopted mum, mm. friend mum thing. Um, what I'd love to try and crack open a little bit in this conversation is, is where do those expectations come from and who expects? Because Blythe certainly expects. And I guess it's true that perhaps we do expect or we demand or we require of ourselves certain ways of being. You know, to be a bad mother is the worst thing a woman can be somehow. Mm. And, and there's mm. a corollary to that, which is all to do with guilt and things. Where, where do you think it starts? Yeah, I, I'm so interested in that question as well. And I've spent a long time thinking about that. And I, I, I was very sort of obsessed with that idea long before I had children of my own. And I think, um, you know, for me, I had come from like my mother is a quintessential, you know, the picture perfect mother. She is very nurturing and very warm. And we always came first. There was three girls in my family. And she she was the embodiment of this maternal um, nurturing like and I and I remember growing up thinking especially as a teenager and kind of like you know, in my early 20s and really like examining that in her and thinking like how like I didn't you know I knew my grandmother as well but like I always wondered like is that just who she is and if she is that way then am I going to be that way and what if I am not because I, I didn't you know I wasn't a little girl who played with dolls or babies or wanted to play house or you know model that um, I just didn't really feel that. And I, so I had always kind of thought a lot about how a woman gets to that point. Um, and then when I started writing, yeah, I, that, that, that those ideas of expectations were so interesting to me because, you know, again, like from the time that we're little girls, I think we are, we start to be taught that that is something that is going to come natural to us, you know, and that part of being a woman is to be a mother. You know, that is very, that is a very loud message and very clear message, I think, mm -hmm. from society to the point where if you choose not to have children, you become like there's this heightened interest about why, you know, like mm -hmm. we, the default is to have children. And so if you choose not to, um, we want to put this reasoning around people. You know, I have a sister who is 35 and has chosen not to have children. And, you know, she gets asked all the time about people want, people want to put, you know, the reason in a nice tidy box as to why she is not, you know, they want to hear that she is flying through her career and excelling in the career path she's on. Yeah. So she couldn't possibly have time for it. Well, the answer is not that the answer is just that she doesn't want to, you know, and it, mm -hmm. it's hard for her to say that. And it's hard for people to accept that, I think. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I, you mentioned sort of the other's uh, chain of kind of mothers in the story. And I, I did, I realized as I was writing about Blythe, you know, it really just did start as her story, her and Violet's story very much within the context of a marriage, because I, I was really interested in that, um, you know, that pressure and that expectation of both the both partners in that in that marriage, because so much comes down to the mother, but the father can also have those strong expectations of the kind of mother he wants for his child. And, and I realized as kind of I was exploring that, that I couldn't really understand Blythe and who she was without understanding the mothers that she came from. Yeah. And, and I liked this idea of exploring women in her past who probably sh didn't, you know, who well clearly didn't want to become mothers, but went through with it for reasons that were sort of out of their control at the time. Mm. Um, because there's, there's all sorts of different contexts to the way that we become parents and, you know, whether it's a choice or not, or how, how much we are led into that choice or not. Um, so those were all kind of interesting things to me. Yeah. But yeah, I, you know, I think I, it's funny. I have a daughter. Um, I have two kids and my son, who I had mentioned, but I have a little girl who's three. Now she's just turned three. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I have found it just to be absolutely fascinating to watch. Um, I think what, A, like sort of the, um, you know, the gifts that she has been given in her, in her young life, you know, for Christmas and birthdays and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the cradles and the baby bottles and the baby accessories and, um, you know, of course, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, at all. And, and she does have a leaning towards that role playing of family and baby and mother. Mm -hmm. you know, she always wants me to play baby and mom with her. Um, but it's just so interesting, sort of like this environment that I have created even for her at home, where that is like very much a thing that I'm saying is, should be very natural to her, you know? And yeah. So you just, you just think a lot about kind of the messages and yeah, um, whether they're intentional or not, you know, there, a lot of them are just kind of the way we do things, but it's interesting to think about them. 
you, you, you mentioned in passing, and I noticed that Sudi also has mentioned it in the chat, um, postpartum depression or postnatal depression. Mm. So, so um, I've said before that um, to friends and things, to sometimes they did a, do a sharp intake of breath when I say it, but I've said before that becoming a mother was for me as traumatic and painful an experience as losing my mother was. It, the, mm. the, two, the two things were as difficult and uh, bad. Um, and I was, I was diagnosed with postnatal depression, but I resisted that diagnosis and I still resist it now because mm. the doctor said to me, it, you're having an irrational response to the thing that has happened to you. And I said, no, I am not having an irrational response to what has happened to me. Have you seen me? There is only so much agony that a person can take. I haven't slept for more than an hour at a time in the last three months. I've got nothing of my life that I have built up over the last 10 years. This is not, and I, and I really still feel uncomfortable that, that, that mm. because I didn't like it, it was something wrong with me. And that's how it felt when I got that diagnosis. I'd love to know if anybody else kind of responded in that way, or if it was just my belligerence. Is your, is it, your, do, do you think that Blythe in the book, does she have postnatal depression or no? You know, when I was writing, I thought a lot about whether or not to make that explicit or not, or have, have her go through that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I have, to, and I think two reasons. One, I, I really agree with you. I think that what you said is, is so true and it has so much, it, it's so honest, but there's so much, and there's so much truth to it is that, um, I, I think sometimes we can really get validation from, you know, a psychiatric um, diagnosis like that. And that's so important. Like, it's so important that we have that for people that, you know, that, that need that and want that and deserve that. But, but I think there are a lot of other women who, who don't relate with that diagnosis. And it, for, for all the reasons that you just said, instead, it can just be very hard and they can just mm -hmm. not like it. And they can just be really suffering from, um, the total change in identity and the total change in the circumstance of their life and not sleeping at all, which is very real and very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, so I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I don't think life is, is really experiencing postpartum depression. As I understand it, I am not an expert in that at mm -hmm. all. And, um, you know, I'm not, I, I don't have any psychiatric or psychological degree. So oh. I, I hesitate to kind of speak to that, but but she, but yeah, she's, she, more, I more see her as a woman who's going through what you said you went through, which is mm -hmm. um, it being just so ravagingly difficult that she can't recognize herself and she can't function. And, and she, and she then starts to feel like, um, you know, she doubts everything she knows about herself and about her child and about her family and about that circumstance, because nobody is listening to her or validating her or acknowledging that in her, you know, nobody wants to hear her. Yeah. Um, which, which I think that in itself is very much a form of trauma, you know, of being completely ignored and not being believed at all. Um, so yeah. Thanks so much. I'm going to bring in a couple of people from the from the room who've made um, interesting comments. Laura Morris, you've um, written a word here that I've I've never heard before come across. Mat matricence is that how I say it? Matricence. It's Are you there, Laura? Matricence. Matricence. Tell me about French. it. Yeah, so um, basically all of the things that you described was kind of feelings that I had when I became a mum at the relatively later on age of 39. And I just remember feeling like everything had changed and, and there's been this seismic shift in my understanding of myself, in my understanding of the world, in my identity, in my responsibilities. And somebody just shared with me this concept of matrissance and it's mm. it's actually now a thing that it, it's like a change a bit like puberty or a bit like um you know the menopause it's it's both a physiological and a psychological stage gate that you go through when you become a mum that describes that very change that you go through so there's a real sense of having to get to grips with that and coming to terms with it and then moving forwards it's considering how much we know about puberty though that that yeah. thing exists that, that so many of us have yeah. experienced it but it's not known or really acknowledged yeah why it, it, it but you know I've never ever heard of that before and, and as soon as I heard of that concept I was like this is brilliant that now gives me a concept that I can hang my thoughts around and it makes sense you know it, it kind of gives if you like a label to the thing yeah. that I'm feeling and kind of you know 
uh, gives it validation, if you like, that I'm not weird or different. It is actually a thing. It's a real thing. Yeah, it, it, that, that validation. I mean, we've talked, we've had whole thinkings about how difficult it is for women in medical environments to be heard and really mm. it's, a, it's a related kind of concept um I'd love to come um, I'm going to come to Tessa I can't resist because I know that she'll hold forth in fact we can all just go and get a drink and let Tessa take over from here probably but Tessa um I love your NCT story I have a similar one that's to do with expectations too really and, and not wanting to conform and that sort of thing oh god it was awful I really hated NCT I felt um you know, I felt two things. One, that, you, you know, you were being conditioned into what the right behaviour was and what the correct label was. And and and, and there was no subtlety <laughs> or allowance for difference. And so when I got into a slightly heated conversation with the woman about this sort of insistence that breast was best and anything other than that was a failure, I felt so angry about it. Mm. Um, and, yeah, as I said, sort of ended up being... It's, it was suggested I didn't come back the following week. <laughs> Gosh, you, you got fired from the NCT. I got fired that? from the NCT. But then at the other, the, on the other side of it, I, I, I also sometimes, I was incredibly lucky and ended up, you know, having really extraordinarily brilliant and easy labours. Don't ask, don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, but when I did also feel that there was a sort of, um, a, a very... Uh, and I'm going to, I'm saying this carefully, a sort of adherence to the war stories of motherhood that, mm. that, that were kind of worn like a badge of honour. So when I said, I actually, I found it a really extraordinarily wonderful and powerful and, and great. I mean, I felt like a warrior afterwards. I was, you know, on my kitchen floor three hours later, all done. You know, I felt like a superhero. People don't want to hear that. Women don't want to hear that. They, they want to hear it's awful. We've got to keep telling everybody how awful it is as well. So that's my other flip side of it is interesting. Um, you know, I felt like a real traitor to the cause, having not had a 36 in you know, hour induced and emergency C-section at the end of it, um, that that wasn't allowed in the conversation either. either. How funny that's mm. more expectations that the sort of line of acceptable experience is so narrow and yet the range of real experience is so absolutely broad and infinite, really. And how silly we are that Tessa would feel she couldn't come back. You know, my second labour was incredible. It was, it was brilliant. I thought, this is it. I've cracked it. I mean, I didn't yeah. have another one. But you know, it wasn't that good. <laughs> but it, you know, it, it, let's get out on a high, Liz. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do wonder as well. There was a little bit. Of, there's a part of me that says, you know, people don't tell you how how difficult it's going to be, and people don't prepare you. I'm not sure that's totally true because I think there is now quite a well-established culture perhaps not so much my son is 10 and it's I think it's happened it's really crystallized perhaps in that time since that um it's a sort of have a glass of wine get through it oh the house is a mess never mind we love them anyway there's a sort of quite mm -hmm. skin deep or oh, we're all supposed to be a bit grotty but we sort of are competitive too vibe about motherhood that I wonder is you know probably not no more helpful than it was when I was doing mine and having the sort of thou shalt breastfeed pressure. I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think um, I, I couldn't agree more. I, and I, it ties into both of those wonderful comments. And thank you for sharing those are both so inter such interesting perspectives. And, you know, I, I think, Liz, I think you're, it, it's absolutely right that most like recently, I would say like in the past, um, you know, like five or six years, uh, certainly since I had my son, which was six years ago, um, you know, there is, there is this sense, and I think I, I'm going to compare it to put it in the context of social media, because I think that has a lot to do with it and kind of this mm -hmm. online connection that we have with other moms, which is, you know, flourish like that, that whole online connection with mom communities is huge now. And it, and it serves a wonderful, meaningful purpose. Like, thank goodness for that, because there, there's a lot of good and connection that comes out of that. But, but I do think it has sent mothers this message that, um, you know, you can, you can share, you know, show, like, let, show us the real, what your real day looks like, you know, put, mm -hmm. post pictures of what your messy playroom looks like at the end of the day, you know, post pictures of like, you know, the chaos that's happening in your house, but, um, you know, but, but, there, but we're, there's still a limit to how much we can share in that vein as well. And there's still, it is still very much a filtered, 
um, view, I think, of who we are as mothers, you know, like filtered both, you know, in the literal sense and not, but, um, you know, and I, I remember feeling that too. Like I, I looked back, I was looking back through pictures that I had posted on Instagram um, and I, I posted a picture when my son was little and I had said something like, about how exhausting motherhood was, like I was so tired and I was exhausted. And, you know, the picture was like this filtered, really nice black and white picture. Like I didn't look tired at all, you know, I really didn't. But it was like this caption of like, trying to re like, you know, feel relatable and like share what I was really feeling. And I, I yeah, I, so I feel like there is this sense that we are very much encouraged now to share, but only share so much, you yeah. know, it's like, yeah. like show, show us what motherhood is like, be honest about it, but it is, there it is like the iceberg right it is like show us the top of the iceberg but there's a lot going on underneath that we're we're still not encouraged to share and we would still feel shame or judgment for sharing and you know there's this the story that when I was um you know when my son was ill still this was like in the first year of his life um you know I had done a lot of yoga when I was pregnant and you know was feeling good about that fact and really was looking forward to kind of joining back in with that circle of moms who did all this prenatal yoga together where, you know, we would go back to the same yoga center with our babies and do the mom and baby yoga, which was like a thing, you know, that moms were doing. And I was just, I was so looking forward to doing that. And I wasn't able to do it for so many months because he was just too, I couldn't bring him there. And then when he finally was able, when I finally was able to, I remember feeling like nervous because I hadn't done any typical kind of mom thing yet with my, with him. And I brought him to this yoga class and they started the yoga class. I didn't, you know, know anybody there, but I, they started the yoga class with the yoga instructor said, um, you know, can we go around the circle and share what motherhood has been like for you so far? And so, you know, the babies are on the mat kicking or whatever, and everyone kind of went around and shared, you know, like, you know, oh, it's so hard having no sleep or, oh, it's, you know, like, the, you know, the typical things that we're sort of allowed to say, you know, like to the point, like where, you know, it took me a long time to recover from birth or whatever it was. Yeah. And then it got to be my turn and I was so, you know, just destroyed and emotional and tired at that point still from everything that we had been through. And I thought oh, maybe I shouldn't share that he's sick and that he's, he's had this illness and that we spent all this time in the hospital. Like it's just maybe going to feel like too much. And so I tried to think of something else to say and I just couldn't. And so I said, I just said, I said that, oh, you know, he's been really sick and he's had this illness and it's been really hard because I, you know, because of all these things. And I remember kind of looking around the room and everyone was, oh yeah, so sorry. So I had said, I had said that he was ill or that he was sick and the yoga instructor thought that she didn't hear me properly. She thought that she had misheard me. And so she asked me to say it again. And so I like stated it a second time and, and really everyone's eyes sort of fell to the floor, you know, and nobody said anything about it. It just yeah. sort of fell on these deaf ears and we kind yeah. of moved along into the yoga class and nobody said anything to me after class about it either. And it wasn't even that I wasn't even that I wanted, you know, to, to have these conversations with these strangers. It was more just that I instantly had this feeling like I had said too much, you know, like I like that was a place that we weren't willing to go because yeah. that was a that yeah. was a darker, very, very real cool. place it was too much. And like, we were okay to talk about the hard nights and we were okay to talk about breast breastfeeding being difficult, but the sick child was like another level, you know? And so it was just, and I, I really remember thinking then like, wow, there really is this message about you can share, but you can't share too much, yeah, you know? Sure. And I think that's true. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ashley. I'm going to bring in some more people from the, from the chat. Cause there are some, um, I'm really noticing, and those people who do lots of thinkings will perhaps be noticing too, I'm really noticing a difference in the, the quality. I don't mean quality like better or worse, but the nature of the contributions to the chat mm. is very different this evening than in some of the sort of perhaps more male thinkings that we've had, which in itself is interesting. But let's go to Abby Mallet. Um, I know you haven't got your camera, Abby, but I'd love to hear a little bit about you're making a specific comment um, about the book and about the sort of the filtering down through the generations of different mother daughter relationships and how that can kind of come out. Um, if you're there, Abby, I'd love to hear you talk about it a bit. I am. I'm sorry. I don't have my, uh, oh, no, don't worry. my it's Zoom is not working properly. That's um, okay. It's such an, I really enjoyed the book and, um, thank you for, uh, thank you for writing it, but, um, I've, I i do not have any children. And when I was reading the book, I was very, I was very focused on the, um, the relationship between Blythe and the, her mother and grandmother. Um, and especially the first half of the book where there was, it, it was setting out their stories and what had happened to them individually as, as individuals as they were going through their, their lives. 
Um, and I could see from it that I, I kept forgetting, oh, did that happen to Etta or did that happen to, oh, I must go back and check. And actually it sort of dawned on me halfway through, well, it actually happened to all of them because mm. can you, whether I, I don't know how far you can separate out the impact of the bereavement that Etta suffered right back in around the Second World War down to the way that Blythe um, interacts with her, her firstborn. Um, and I just think it's really interesting, the impact of abuse and trauma and how it filters down the generations mm. um, and, and continues to impact on those, uh, you know, that, that those who come afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that was a conscious dis um, part of your writing or, or whether that was just something that came out naturally as you were as you were going through it. Thanks, Abby. They call it transgenerational haunting, don't they? When when things are sort of retained in people that shouldn't remember the original event, but they are somehow connected to the person that did remember the original um, event. M Millie Peacock, are you there? Because you had a similar sort of comment about this sense of whether the way Violet turns out is somehow predetermined or you know is, is it destiny or, or or is it because of the way that Blythe responds to her in some way and, and it's not clear is it? Yeah and I really love that it was kind of like um, this serious issue that we're talking about in the book and that Ashley's gone through but made into kind of like a thriller and a cliffhanger. Um, I work with coaching for new mums I work like in mm. motherhood coaching and it is really interesting to hear that some of the biggest kind of um, hurdles that couples go through in this like early parenting journey is that um, without realizing we can often revert to parent the way that we were parented without even kind of thinking that this would happen. Mm -hmm. um, and like for an example, you know, I worked with a couple who were just totally in love, had a brilliant relationship, traveled the world together and everything, but it took having children together to bring up all this childhood trauma um, mm -hmm. that the father had gone through and he, without even thinking or being conscious of it, he was reverting to parent in quite a totalitarian, quite strict way, um, wow. his son, but then treating his daughter differently. Um, and this is just the way, you know, once we kind of went into it, that um, he was brought up, you know, to if he wasn't eating his dinner or sitting properly at the table, he would have to stand outside in the cold. And he instinctually went back to that kind of pattern. Um, and it was quite discerning for the mum to think, who is this person I've married and who I'm parenting with? Um, you know, you think you know someone, but it's, quite shocking how these patterns and um, yeah familiar ways of interacting with children come up from our own ways that our own parents interacted with us. Mm. For sure thanks Millie and um, Ashley mm. would you want to just respond a little bit to what Millie and Abby have spoken about? Yeah that's that's a fascinating example that um, that Millie just spoke about yeah I I was really interested in exploring that in this book and was what, what consciously wanted to um, to kind of show those kind of patterns of behavior and some of the patterns of behavior are repeated and some of them you know each of the mothers is very conscious of not repeating and I think you know Blythe is in the mind frame where you know she has pieced together these parts of her past um, you know from the woman women before her she doesn't have the whole picture you know but but she knows the things obviously that are in this book and I think it's very true that a person you know when you have that knowledge of the, those that trauma that you've come from you, 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 if you're conscious of that, you know, you make a decision to go one of, you will go one of two ways. You will, you know, fight to do everything you can to be different and be a different kind of parent and not repeat those things almost to the point of, you know, being obsessed with not being like that parent you came from. Um, or in the, as in the example, even that Millie just brought up, you know, you, you can't help but repeat them yeah. and they're just in you. And I think that, and you have to work very hard, you know, to, 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 to kind of free yourself of that way of behavior, that way of thinking. And, you know, Blythe is in a state where, you know, she's very aware that there is this fork in the road. And that even that awareness, it gives her so much anxiety that 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 be standing in that gray area is almost more than she can bear, you know, because because she is so aware of it and she does think so much about it. Um, and I did, um, you know, some research when I was writing the book about that idea of intergenerational trauma. And there's so much fascinating science um, that, you know, within, even in with the last decade um, and some really, you know, fascinating studies that have been done to show, you know, how 
um, that kind of trauma because of the you know stress reaction that we have to it um, mm -hmm. can physically alter our DNA and that and that is physically passed down um, you know in our genes and it's it's so it works on both levels there is a physical impact it is a very real thing and it is also very much a psychological thing you know mm -hmm. there's a really interesting um, article that it was a, in a science journal that I came across. It was from 1975, and I think it was in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And the title of this, um, this article has stayed with me since. The title was um, Ghosts in the Nursery, which is such a powerful image, such a powerful phrase. And that that looked at that study was done with mothers and children and it was it was exactly what we're talking about it was that you know the things that you carry that you are almost haunted by you know whether you realize it or not um you know into that nursery with your own baby and in and with raising them and yeah it is a very real thing and i think you know i also find interesting the idea that many of us don't know um the the kind of histories that we come from you know we we might not have access to that information about um, the kinds of childhood that our parents had or the kinds of childhood that our grandparents had or that information comes out so much later in life, you know, far after we're done kind of raising our own children. And a lot, I think it's hard for a lot of people to kind of cope with that about, you know, what they didn't know. Um, and they, they may have, you know, listened to lots of really interesting interviews with, um, you know, between therapists and patients where, um, you know, they, they just wish that they had known so much more about the traumatic past they came from earlier in their life. So they could have yeah. coped with it in a different way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I'm going to just pick up, there's, I'd, I'd like to come to Adrienne, I'd like to come to Emily, um, but I'm just going to come before we move on to Anushka, Anushka Sharma, who's used another word, epigenetics, which I, um, I'm not sure I understand fully what you mean. Um, Anushka, are you there? Hi there, good evening. Yes, Hello. I am. Um, epigenetics is just an, another kind of burgeoning area in science where we're learning about how things from the past are kind of coded into your DNA. Um, so things oh, like, for instance, I know we talk about how if you're, um, if a parent of yours was an alcoholic, that there's a certain tendency of a leaning towards alcoholism um, mm. in the children. And I think that's one of the most kind of like simple ways to describe it. And I think maybe that's what we're trying to describe and will come, will come to light in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. But um, the psychological aspect I think is really interesting when it comes yeah. to epigenetics and not something I'm an expert on. So mm -hmm. I will, um, I'll leave it there. But I will say this, like my dad was actually born during partition in India, which mm -hmm. is a very traumatic time for my, yeah. my grandmother and obviously my, my dad and his childhood and growing up. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's like an emotion in my voice that you might hear because it's mm -hmm. something that we're all still understanding. And I only really got to terms with it um, about two to three years ago at India's 70th mm -hmm. um, Independence Day. So yeah. yeah, as a second generation Indian, that's something that is impacting my life. But yeah, uh, thank you. I'm really intrigued to read your book now. I haven't yet, but I'm- Thank I'm you. Really thank you so much. Um, thank you for that. Um, perhaps we could go to Adrienne, Adrienne Brewer, if you're there, because you made a comment that caught my eye a little earlier in the chat about um, men. I don't want to sort of spend the rest of the evening talking about men because they get enough of their fair share of the <laughs> airtime. But I think your point, Adrienne, is, is nuanced and important. It was just in response. Um, Tessa was saying that she, she felt that she couldn't really talk about when um, that it was that she had a brilliant birth. Now I should probably preface it that um, I had three boys, I have three boys, none of them were easy births. And I think it's not so much that we want to revel in the, the gory of it and, and the, the difficulty of it, but I think it is important when we go through that experience, particularly in our culture where, you know, I mean, nowadays my children are all, even the youngest is now in his 20s, so he's 20. So, um, but today to have a baby, they have you going out of the hospital within hours. And I don't mean because of the pandemic. I mean, yeah. before that, there is no, re it's like on you go. And if you've got older children, if it's not your first, you know, you're almost expected to be seen pushing the newborn baby to school the following day. And I think that that's really unjust towards the experience, whether it was a difficult childbirth or an easy one, I don't think is really the, the essence of it, but more that this is a really huge deal that we've done. And actually, I won't be able to say that word either, but that mat mattress and um, the idea that we've gone through this enormous change, both in growing a human being inside and then getting it out again. And that 
and maybe it is something that, you know, men just need to realize as they stand beside us that this was a difficult thing and this was an exhausting thing. And that actually to step back and say, I need to recover is an important part of that process. Yeah. And I think when you don't allow that, you actually can even sometimes see, um, I am a psychotherapist, I'm a psychologist. I'm not sure there's evidence for this, but I think there could be connections between those experiences and then the postnatal depression as well. Mm. Um, so it's interlinked and it's just something that, you know, I don't want, I don't think that we should be hiding those stories or glamorizing them, but just yeah. taking time to really appreciate and say this was this was a hard thing to do and it, it deserves some respect and some time to to recover from even if you've had an easy birth yeah I mean it just mm -hmm. seems to be a kindness in a way to sort of just give somebody the space to mm -hmm. to do that physical and mental sort of adjustment and, and, and processing and, and recovery um, I'm going to go next um, to there's a really fascinating conversation about epigenetics and this to sort of follow on with this sort of generational theme I'm gonna go I might go to um Susie Kershaw if you're there Susie um because you've sort of been researching a little bit your family and you made a couple of comments earlier on um mm. about um hiya Susie nice to yeah. see you hi hi hello am I there yes I am you yes. are there yes yeah yeah I've been looking at what happened because my grandfather was wounded so badly that he went actually into becoming an internee in Switzerland right they looked after badly wounded prisoners mm. and I I believe that from uh, finding ways in which I couldn't work out what was happening to me physically and what was what I was dealing with in my life and I thought what are my whole generation of brothers sisters and cousins uh, how they're living has part of this really bad range of wounds that mm. my grandfather carried yeah. and he survived long enough to come back to this country but his first son his wife went out to switzerland where he was interned and she stayed there I, this was a whole new thing for me in fact i still want to find the wives stories mm. but she was there for long enough to have her first baby there Gosh. But he was very badly wounded and so had to be taken care of well enough to come back on a hospital ship. And the story that my mother used to quote was my father, who was so badly wounded at Mons, this is my mother speaking, mm. and then her mother coming back alone with the baby because she couldn't travel on the hospital ship. And right. so I really, I'm quite sure that the different aspects that are present in my cousins and myself come through the children of that wounded man and this I think is epigenetics as to how long that takes to work through the mm. generations and some days I think maybe I have if I can look at it positively I can say that actually I've broken a, a line here without having children myself yeah mm. yes interesting um, and I watch what's going on with my close relatives or my godchildren but I have this feeling that actually this is an aspect that um, there's something there I do uh, if anyone can help me I would like to say I want to know how my mother my grandmother who I never met got out to Switzerland because the stories are not there I can't find the stories yeah fascinating Susie yeah. good luck in your research I do feel a tortoise investigation coming on somewhere in amongst all of this which is what we do these thinkings for at the end of the yeah. day and yeah. um, I, I can't not um, go to Sudi Piggott, who's, who's commented a number of times throughout as the conversation has gone on. Um, I, she's a regular on Tortoise Thinking. Hi, Sudi, nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> You've got a lovely, got a lovely grown up son, but you had a nightmare in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about all kinds of things to do with your family heritage. Just pick up some of these, anything you want to talk about. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think one of the fundamental things is that you're not told that it's quite boring. And I thought, oh God, you know, I think that I didn't feel like a naturally nurturing, nurturing mother at first, although they subsequently, you know, and I'm still obsessed with my son. And I can remember my mom telling me not that many years ago, just leave him alone because I just couldn't, because I mean, I just adore him. But in the early years, I just thought, what? 
this is so boring. And I'd be on the phone all the time and I'd be trying to do my work as a food journalist and things and not giving him much attention. Then I'd feel really guilty that I was doing that. And yeah, and I spent a lot of time on my own because my husband was working, then yeah. husband was working at antisocial hours. And, you know, and then my mum had been a very conventional, in very nice terms, nurturing stay at home mother and she did fuss an awful lot and I took on a lot of you know her being neurotic and I think that got me down um mm -hmm. although I had some depression before but there were times quite a lot of times and even in um you know I would say about five years ago when I struggled to be a good parent because of depression mm -hmm. and it's really hard and you know, my son's very successful, very young, but he's also very anxious. And I mean, and I know that's something mm. that yeah. you know, he's, he's taken on board. He couldn't, he couldn't have not taken it on board. Although, strangely, I don't feel so anxious these days. Um, yeah, that's good. Mm. Lovely to see you as always, um, Sudi, and thanks for, nice to h hear about your big son who you who you love and adore. There's yeah. a lot of um, love for a comment that Ellen Halliday, my colleague Ellen Halliday's just made in the chat about oral history. And actually, I yes. was going to say to you, when you were talking about your relationship with your mom earlier on, mm -hmm. and we've said a lot of, that's a few, few times people have said, or oh, you're not told, nobody tells you. I guess my wonder is, have you asked your mom? Do you, how, how much have you gone to her and said, mom, how was it for you? It's such a good question. You know, I've been thinking about this in the past couple of weeks, having now that this book is out and and having these kind of conversations because, you know, I really haven't and I and I want to. And I think I have asked my mom more about how she views her mother's experience because my grandmother is not alive anymore. And I'm very curious about what that, what her mothering experience was like, you know, at the time that she was having children. And I think that she struggled more than my mother did. Um, but I haven't, I, I haven't had that conversation with my mom very bluntly. And I, I think because it, it's a, there's some vulnerability there that you really need to kind of have, I think, to have that honest conversation. And I, I need to do that. It's something that I want to take away from having all these conversations about the book, um, because I totally agree about that oral history and the role that women play in kind of carrying that along and, and storytelling and remembering and, and all of that. And I think, and there, there is very much some of that in the book, you know, where um, I think part of why Blythe wants to capture these stories of her mother um, mm. and her grandmother is because, you know, she, she's writing this book, you know, in to her husband, it, basically, the book is kind of a memoir of sorts of hers, and she's speaking to her husband through the yes. whole book. Um, but she also knows this is for her daughter, you know, she is handing this over to her daughter as well, because, you know, I don't want to give away anything at the end, but or what happens at the end of the book, but but, it, but the, you know, it's, it's written down history and not oral, but it is that she ha does have that same need to kind of be passing these stories along to the next generation mm -hmm. of women, um, you know, in Violet. And yeah, I think it's such an, it, it's been a really interesting takeaway for me kind of talking about this and sort of thinking about what I know about um, about the women in my history. And one thing as well is that, you know, my, my uh, this is not on my mother's side, on my father's side, um, you know, she, ever since I started having children, my, my grandmother on that side has suffered from dementia and she can no longer, she's alive, but she can't tell those stories anymore, you know? And so my sisters and I have really been trying to like mine my father's mind for, you know, what her childhood was like. She had a very traumatic history, very, very traumatic past of being abandoned and growing up in the war, you know, horrible things. Um, and, and now we're, and, you know, I think that now that we're all older and my dad is older and my aunt is older, there, there's more of an appetite to know, but she can't share anymore, you know? And so it's, yeah there is there's a sadness there too um, um actually um, i wonder if there's a lovely idea in the chat here about whether tortoise could do a sort of oral living mm -hmm. you know, sort of listening project but just for the girls um i love that i, I love, love that idea. the idea of I, I i i have i just i don't want to sort of as i said to to adrian i don't want to sort of give the rest of the thinking over to the men but i do just want to talk to you about fox yeah mm -hmm. because I really struggled with him I was mm -hmm. so angry with him and I wonder if you deliberately made him a non-sympathetic character you know his absence his the sort of laziness with which he sort of 
sort of forces Blythe into this shape that she isn't and how easily their relationship sort of ebbs away and then the mother-in-law who keeps telling her how lucky she is to have him I was like oh my god mm. I, I know. he's he's it, was, is that just me being cross with him or is that deliberate that he's almost not there at all that he's almost not there at all you know yeah so it's funny because in the um the, the earlier versions of this book the um the drafts that I had before I did the revisions with my editors from the publishing houses, um, Fox was far worse than he is now, even <laughs> he was terrible. And the editors all said, I had three wonderful editors from the publisher in Canada, the US and the UK, they, they worked together and we all worked together as, as a team and they're all women. And every single one of them said, he is so, uh, we hate him. We loathe him. We can't stand reading about him. You have got to make this character better. You've got to make him a little nicer. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because my husband who had read the draft had said to me, do you think that, you know, you're being a little harsh on Fox? Like, do you think he's not quite a likable character? And I had sort of told him to stuff it that, you know, he didn't, it's not about men, it's about women. And the, the man can be, you know, a very unlikable character. Yeah. But they, they did have a point and I needed to go back and create a, you know, a little more likability in him, I think, because that is, you know, the, because he, I, I sort of felt like we had to understand why Blythe loved him in the first place. And she did, you know, she did start out in a very good relationship with him and um, a very positive relationship with him. So yeah, so if you think he's bad now, he was way worse before. But, <laughs> but you know, I think, but I think there are one, you know, one interesting comment that has come up from readers about Fox that I think is worth considering is that you know he, he he is not a good you know not a good partner and he you know in a sense sort of gaslights her in many he ways and in he that does. yeah that he he doesn't want to hear her truth and it is a, not a convenient truth for him and so you know he really quiets her and silences her because he has an expectation of her to be a certain kind of mother he has an expectation to have a certain kind of mother for his child and so he, you know he doesn't want to deal with her but one of the comments that has come up that I think um, made me think is that, you know, he was a bad husband, but, um, you know, was he a good father? And it's that sort of division between what makes a good partner versus what makes a good father. And if you can separate those things or if they are one in the same, which I think we all sort of, you tend mm -hmm. to think of them as being one in the same, but in a way you could see it like Fox felt like he owed his daughter somebody who, who could, he felt like he needed to stand up for her. He felt like he needed to give his daughter the best shot at being the kind of, you know, a productive human being, you know, who was, who was, who was going to escape these kinds of labels that he felt his wife was putting on her. Um, so there is that perspective of it. It's a, it, you know, it's, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that perspective, but I have definitely heard people, um, you know, I, hear, I, 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 I appreciate that perspective on him yeah. from, from a father, you know, he, he's very protective of his daughter and, and shouldn't a father be protective of his daughter, you know? And so there's that yeah. as well. It's, it's complex, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, Emily, Emily, Ben, are you there? My lovely colleague. Uh, I am here. Hello. Hello, Emily. Nice to see you. Hello. I've never spoken on a thinking before. I'm very oh, well, nice. welcome. <laughs> this is your moment. Make it good. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. That's a no massive pressure. pressure. <laughs> um, actually, I, I ordered the book today, actually, so I, I can't wait to read it. And this has been quite the Great. wetter. But um, I, I guess my 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 only point, my having thinking about this a lot at the moment, and especially this, I'm someone that's always known I desperately want to have children that I am. Um, I just I, I can't I can't stop myself going up to see hi, say hi to young people. And I am um, godmother. You know, I, I have launched year long campaigns yeah. to become godmother for people that aren't even <laughs> because I'm desperate I will send them stuff I, I just and that's been one of the hardest things in the last year but uh it's not being able to see them and the other kind of hardest bit is it's made me question whether it will ever happen for me because you know I thought I turned 30 I thought this is gonna be great finally mm -hmm. uh, and you got the, the clock pressure and you know I have a dad who's desperate to have grandchildren it it just feels like a lot it felt like a lot of pressure and then suddenly I had a whole year where I haven't really been able to leave my house I haven't met anyone and you suddenly start, I just start to question whether all the certainties mm -hmm. I had about my life and my entire life, one certainty was having children. It started to make me question it. And I found it incredibly hard. And I'm finding mm -hmm. it, I'm really finding it really difficult. And um, the longer it goes on, the more I'm questioning it. And it, I, I'm sure, you know, this has been an incredibly different period for everyone, but I guess 
for people in my situation in this context, it's hard because it's... Emily, are you able to articulate, this is probably a very unfair question, but are you able to articulate why you feel so strongly you want to have a family? I, I, well, I, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very good question and I can't, I find it hard to verbalise it. I just, it's you just feel like it. coming out of me. I, mm. I can't describe it from the minute I can remember. I've always wanted to have have a baby. I've loved babies. I love looking after them. It's just, it makes me the happiest thing. It just makes me incredibly happy. And these aren't my kids. Like in some cases I'm related to them, but often I've just decided to, become, it's just, I can't really describe it. And it's, it's just always been so central to my idea of life that this would happen to me and it, it would happen for me. And I think when you start questioning something that's so central mm. to what you think your life will be, it, it kind of throws all, all kinds of things a bit off yeah. balance if that makes sense apologies if and nothing I've said has made sense but it's no no absolutely and I, I haven't really spoken about it but now I've decided to talk about it to <laughs> 61 people but um <laughs> yeah. uh it's it's and you know lots lot, you know lots of so many friends of mine are now having babies because I'm kind of at the age that's that it's the age that it starts and I go to weddings and I'm the only single one and you know it's, it's just yeah, I don't thanks so much, that. Emily. Well done, and congratulations on your thinking debut. I'm going to go to um, Bliss if Bliss is okay to come on because I I can't not ask. Your hiya, Bliss. Are you okay? I'm all right. How are you? Can yeah, you I'm hear all right. me? Thank you. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, you've That's mentioned fast, a couple of things in, in the chat, but that question I just asked Emily of Are you able to articulate why? Do they really ask yeah. you that on the surrogacy form? Yeah, so and it's quite high up. So you have to go through, you have to justify why you sort of warrant uh, another woman carrying your child. And you have to go into quite a lot of detail about your medical uh, situation and you have to have doctor's reports and all that sort of thing. But then there are these. Uh, then there are these questions, you know, why do you want to have children? What makes you think you're going to be a good parent? I mean, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It, I mean, it's I think that was the thing that Mehmet, my husband, and I found ourselves getting so frustrated about because, you know, um, we didn't choose this. We, you know, we're in mm. this situation because, of, uh, you know, because of what's happened to me. But how many, how many couples, you know, meet in a nightclub? And having having sex up against the mm. back door and then and suddenly landing with a child and they're, they're never nobody ever says to nobody them like to in that form. have you thought this through you know yeah. what what do you think that you can offer to that child and then here we are just so I mean I kind of I kind of agree with Emily in a way it's very difficult to artic articulate why mm. but you know we definitely want to have children um, and, and it's going to be really difficult for us Fliss, mm. we love you and we wish you all the very, very best. Um, and if you think of a really good answer to the question, then let us all know. So we can it um, yeah. Because I think that's incredibly difficult to articulate. Actually, we're already at, at half past seven and the time's really oh. flown. Um, and I, I, I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. And the book is absolutely brilliant. I mean, I did it in, I did it in two sessions over Christmas because I needed to make time to drink Bailey's and eat crisps as well. So I had to split it into two, but um, it's, absolutely brilliant I've really really enjoyed it um and we wish you Thank all you. the very very best with it and um, what I really hope I really hope that men and buy it and read it too um mm -hmm. because it's all very well us sharing our experiences and as people have said you know there's there's been a lot of you know difficult and poignant things and personal things we've talked about um, and women can do that but I think that it's the story of women's realities that men really need to, to hear too. So I, I very, very much hope that that happens. Thank you for saying that. And thank you for having me. This was by far the most engaged in conversation that I've had about this book. It's remarkable. And thank you for everyone who shared every comment. I was just like nodding along and taking notes about things people were saying. And this was just wonderful. I, yeah, thank you so much really for your time. It's and, and I agree pleasure. with you about the men. <laughs> thank you so much Ashley and good luck oh. with, um, with the rest of the book thank you so much to everybody who's come and shared so openly and articulately um, this yeah. evening. I really enjoyed it we could definitely do another hour which is always a sign of a good thinking um, so thank you so much for being here um, tomorrow evening it could scarcely be more different we're going to do rugby sure we'll see you <laughs> then have a nice rest of the evening everyone all the best bye 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 thank you